Next on Astronomy Toronto, a visit to the McLaughlin Planetarium to see the new Astro Centre displays and the mysteries of the Star Theatre. Welcome to Astronomy Toronto. I'm your host, my name is Randy Atwood, and I'm a member of the Toronto Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Today, we're in Toronto's McLaughlin Planetarium, and we'll be looking at the Star Theatre and the new display area, the Astro Centre, with the Planetarium's director, Dr. Tom Clark. Tell me a little bit about the McLaughlin Planetarium. We all drive by it, but I'm sure a lot of people don't know about its history. The Planetarium opened in the fall of 1968. And uh, it had come, a, come about as a result of a, of a long series of events, which uh, in 1965 led to the uh, setup of a, of a group of people, uh, some amateur astronomers and some professional astronomers in Toronto, to try to get a planetarium for, for the city. And it was always to be part of the Royal Ontario Museum because the University of Toronto would provide the land. They just got their committee together and sort of put out the word that they were going to raise the money and lo and behold, Colonel McLaughlin appeared on the scene and offered to provide the planetarium. All the money, everything. And then over a period of three years, it was designed and built and opened in uh, late October of 1968. And uh, the main purpose of the planetarium, I guess, is uh, shows in the Star Theatre? Well, the, ma the main purpose of the planetarium is education and astronomy in, in the very broadest sense. So, And it focuses in on the activities that take place in the Star Theatre. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of activities also outside of the Star Theatre, particularly in uh, relation to community groups and, uh, and teaching and that kind of thing. But no planetarium can be a planetarium without one of these things. So the shape of the projector is so that we can mimic or copy the, uh, the night sky? The projector is a very functional shape. It has to have the two domes, the two heads, because there's a northern and a southern hemisphere and uh, it has to uh, be correctly positioned relative to the center of the dome in order to get a, a proper representation of the sky. And the dumbbell actually maintains the projection lens as a constant distance from the center. So it's quite a technological marvel, and uh, uh, it was quite a credit to the engineers who worked it out 60 years ago. How many stars can we, uh, can we see in, here in the dome? Uh, the projector will project 9,000 stars. Is that comparable to what we can yeah, see? Yeah, 4,500 in a hemisphere, and I think that's fairly typical of an average person. There are certainly people we know who can claim many more, but for the average person, it's about 4,500. But not from downtown Metro Toronto? Not from downtown Metro Toronto, no. And uh, uh, we tell our students that uh, they can count them if they want, but they, they might take our word for it. Another service offered by the planetarium are evening courses on astronomy. We have a number of evening courses uh, dealing at the introductory level, usual, usually with astronomy and with simply uh, hands-on sort of observing ideas for people who just want to become more familiar with what they can see in the sky. And as well as that, uh, in the last couple of years, we find a greater and greater interest in what we call a uh, stargazing course, which is run on Monday nights, the only night where there aren't regular shows in the Planetarium Theatre. And this is an opportunity for people to come in, in a two-hour session, really get acquainted with the constellations. And uh, the numbers aren't large, but uh, they're sufficient to, to maintain the course. And uh, uh, people come away from those sessions, I think, with a feeling that they can then go out and look at the sky and, and start to recognize some of the constellations. Well, the Zeiss projector behind us is, uh, it looks very complicated, but it, uh, you should see the control panel. It looks like you're sitting in front of a uh, 747. 
uh, control panel. And we're going to take a look at that, and maybe Tom can explain to us a little bit of how one flies one of these size projectors. Uh, this is the, the control controls by which we can uh, use all aspects of, of this ice projector. All the controls for the motions, the lights, the, the special indicator lines that are actually here on the board and uh, can all be controlled manually. So uh, a lecturer can make up what he or she wants to say and then uh, as, uh, as you talk, as I talk, you push the various buttons. This isn't the original control board actually. This is actually the uh, newer board that uh, was uh, brought in when it brought in computer control. But uh, we kept the facility to do a completely live lecture because uh, those kinds of lectures work very well with school groups and special interest groups such as the RESC, which sure. has regular demonstrations. Here. I can remember coming in here uh, in 1979. We were all set to go out to Manitoba to see an eclipse of the sun. And with the controls, we set the sky to see what we would see during the eclipse. And I guess one can do that. You can go to any part of the Earth at any point in time to see what the sky looks like. That's right. You, uh, uh, once you've set the projector up for the date, and usually it's around the time, the actual date, to keep the sky current, then you can simply uh, move uh, forward in time, essentially by turning the switch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the various parts of the projector start to move, and uh, uh, things uh, turn on, and you can uh, turn on uh, suns and moons, and mm -hmm. uh, just by pushing buttons on it, and they fade up uh, uh, nice and slow. There goes the moon across the sky. Mm -hmm. well, there goes the sun across the sky. Some of the other things here, we got constellations where we can put the, the pictures of the figures, the... right? Uh, we have the ecliptic, uh, which allows us to uh, position the sun accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, we have eclipses of the sun and moon on it, uh, the various planets. Just uh, by punching buttons, you bring Saturn and Jupiter right, up. Right, and raise them up. Uh, we can actually zoom Saturn and Jupiter up from uh, starlike images, or almost starlike images, up to comet, up to telescopic images. Um, we have a, a satellite here. Uh, we have shooting stars, uh, which create a great rumble. <laughs> <laughs> so we can turn on shooting stars and have auroras going on. And, uh, well, not auroras on this one. That's a nope. special effect. Oh, I see. But we can have satellites, and uh, we can put up horizon glows, and uh, uh, we can put up a map of the Earth mm -hmm. to show where we are on the Earth, because we can uh, move from uh, uh, one part of uh, the Earth to the other. We can change latitude, oh, pole to pole. So that's, that, that's what it means by being a universal instrument, you can go from pole to pole. So it's a lot warmer going to the South Pole on your planetarium than uh, doing that's it. That's right, and faster, too. <laughs> Tell me about, uh, about the, the computer. What does that mean now that you have uh, a computer set up? Well, the computer uh, setup allows us to really use a lot of projectors very, very efficiently. Uh, what the computers allow us to do is present a much more sophisticated program, both for the public and for the schools, because uh, the computer can be controlled by a tape, hands off completely, or in fact, it can be controlled by a button. So our lecturers now can sit here and push a button, and the computer then will produce a beautiful sunset or, or whatever effect uh, we've programmed in. This is one of the most, perhaps the most sophisticated theater audiovisual computer system that's available in the world. It's made by Electrosonic of England, uh, and in fact was made very much to our specifications because we needed something bigger than most people have. It has the capability of controlling 192 changing slide projectors, 256 theater dimmers, and 2,000 special effects. Well, Tom, unfortunately we can't show everyone at home all the uh, wonderful effects that you can uh, set up here in the Star Theater, but I guess it's just incentive for the people at home to come and see it for themselves because the eyeball is a lot better than uh, any TV camera available. Uh, but what I would like to see now is uh, the new Astro Center, the planetarium's uh, new display. Okay, it's just it's just one floor below. All right, let's go.
we stopped at the tools of the sky watchers section here and uh, Tom looks like a very familiar uh, observatory yes in a, in a view that most people can't get now because I understand it's surrounded by fence in this section we want people to to get a sense that astronomy is a, is a subject that has been pursued for many many centuries by different cultures and uh, Stonehenge is associated with a very early uh, culture in, in, uh, in England and uh, it's fairly well established as having uh, certain alignments to significant events in the sky. So in a way, it was a kind of astronomical observatory, probably a temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, over here and we also... Uh, people are probably even more surprised to realize that the native peoples of uh, North, Central, and South America were also aware of uh, motions in the sky. And this particular uh, picture is of the, the caracal. Uh, the building is called, and it's fairly well established again through alignments in, in the fact that uh, uh, it was used to observe objects, particularly Venus, which was very significant to the Maya people, and even uh, the plane sediments in North America you know, suggested that their medicine wheels uh, were, had astronomical alignments. So this goes very back uh, quite a bit into human history, and it, and it covers a fair number of cultures that we don't usually associate with this stuff. Well, this whole wall will tell you why the moon has phases, why there are tides, why there are seasons, and why there are eclipses. A lot of information on one wall. I said when we designed this wall that we could probably have a course standing right here if you wanted to sit and expound for hours on this. Basically, we're showing people uh, the phases of the moon in these uh, large pictures across it, and underneath it, the relationship of the phase to where the moon is as it goes around the Earth. And then other diagrams pick up on uh, these other phenomena, uh, such as the tides. And since uh, the, the media universally got the explanation of the high tides in January wrong, mm -hmm. it's, it's probably necessary to have this kind of kind of wall. But we're pleased the way the graphics turned out, and uh, we think uh, that people will be able to use them. Mm -hmm. Eclipses, phases, which actually some people have a great deal of difficulty with. And uh, the seasons are all here, all common phenomena uh, related to the Earth and the Moon, and in case the seasons, the Sun. We're in the solar system section now, and uh, we're by the orrery, and I'm standing at the world selector. That's right, 15 of them. And one of the things that will probably surprise those who haven't much acquaintance with astronomy is that some of those 15 largest worlds in the solar system are moons. And some moons are larger than some planets. Now, if I push one of these buttons, then one of the worlds will shoot up here, and I can see which one uh, we're looking at. Right, the orbit orbit uh, of the particular world you chose remains light if the others uh, dim down. And I can also see the speed. Mercury, the innermost one, is faster than Pluto, which is outermost. The speeds are in exact proportion, as a matter of fact. Uh, Mercury takes 88 days to go once around, and uh, Pluto, 248 years. So you can come and use a stopwatch and just check it out. And some of these uh, moons, like Ganymede, they're bigger than some of the planets, aren't they? That's right. And... Uh, uh, the data slides that come up uh, when you push the button actually indicate the particular size. Uh, one of the curiosities is that uh, Pluto shrank since this thing was designed. In is fact, that right? If we were doing this in 1987, Pluto wouldn't be in the top 15. Is that right? It lost position based it on... It lost its position based on a more accurate measure of its, uh, of its diameter. Well, we're standing beside one of the highlights of uh, the Astro Center, which is the Solar Telescope, where we can look at the Sun live. And uh, Tom, tell us about how we get the sun's image into here. Yeah, up on the uh, corner of the roof, there's a, a capsule which contains a mirror. And uh, that mirror is driven by a computer to track the sun. Uh, through a series of mirrors, the beam of light is, comes down vertically through the roof slab and uh, is intercepted by a series of mirrors here over in the corner. Uh, there are actually three separate optical systems then that uh, produce three images of the sun. The lower bench here contains the optics. It's, it's a telescope, but it's just laid out open without tubes in there. Right. And it uh, produces on the wall behind us a large image of the sun in white light. The upper bench brings the light of the sun through a filter, which isolates a very narrow band of red light, which is produced by hydrogen. Right. And through this eyepiece, we then see some of the phenomena that occur in the chromosphere, the layer of gas just above the bright surface of the sun. And that's where we see the flares and the prominences. Um, the third image, uh, the third beam of light goes actually to the back 
of the solar telescope and can be brought out to a location here and produce a very small, bright image that's good for photography or people to make traces, tracings of it. So once the sunspot cycle starts up again, uh, we hope that people will start making tracings and start tracking the sunspot cycle themselves. And uh, over on the other wall here, we can see uh, the sun live. As long as it's not cloudy. As long as it's not cloudy. And it's not after dark. And you'd be surprised how many people expect to see it after dark. <laughs> We're in the largest section, I guess, and when you're talking about cosmic bodies, and that is the galaxy section. What's a galaxy? The galaxy is uh, uh, it's the largest star systems that we know, and it's an assemblage of, uh, in the case of our own Milky Way, of perhaps 400,000 million stars. On this picture of our galaxy, we could point to where our sun is, which is that little X, and then if I turn on another light, which shows the nearest star to our sun, well, it happens to be just next door. But the most distant visible bright star to our naked eye is pretty close by. It's not all that far away. The Crab Nebula, which is uh, an exploded star remnant, is pretty close by. But if we were to say, look at the region of stars that we can see with our naked eye, it's just that little circle right in there. So we can't see a lot of stars. If I was to turn on a light which shows the region that could be seen with a large optical telescope, then it's a bit bigger. But it just goes to show that the galaxy is very, very large and that we can't see many of the stars in our galaxy. Well, we're standing outside the Stellarium, which is one aspect of the Astro Center that I'm afraid we just aren't able to show you with our current video technology, which is a shame, but it also means that people are going to have to come down and see it. Tell me about the Stellarium. Stellarium is a model, a three-dimensional model of space, the 50 light years of space centered on the sun. And that region of space, as far as we know, contains 787 stars. And they're all in the Stellarium model, as tiny little points of light, correct brightness, the correct color. And for the first time, we can give people an impression that what space is really like, that it's three-dimensional space as opposed to the two dimensions that we see in the photographs. Well, it sounds like uh, the Astro Center is uh, coming to life. People are coming in before the show. What should we know about uh, coming down to the planetarium to see the Astro Center? People can see the Astro Center in two ways. One is they can come to the Star Theater show and uh, see the Astro Center before or after, and it's included in the price of the Star Theater show. Or they can come to visit the Royal Ontario Museum and see the Astro Center along with the other museum galleries. They can start with the Astro Center and go to the museum. They can start the museum and come to the Astro Center. We'd like to thank Dr. Clark and the staff here at the Planetarium for inviting us down for this show. And we'd like to invite all of you to make your way down to the McLaughlin Planetarium and the Royal Ontario Museum to take in the beauty of the Star Theatre and their new display area, the Astro Center. For Astronomy Toronto, my name's Randy Atwood.